Well, the old piano roll blues sounding brilliant and played by Australia's premier organist, in my view, Tony Fenlon, and he's my special guest in studio. How are you, Tony? I'm very well, thanks, Alex. I've been dying to get down to here to hear where true radio emanates from. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, look, you've been around organs for such a long time. When did it all start for Tony Fenlon? Uh, probably the organ part of it started around 1963 or 64, where I did my first actual official concert on theatre organ at the Capitol in Sydney. In the Capitol? Ah, right up there. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. Did you were you did you live in Sydney? Or no, 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 I was in Melbourne. Actually, um, the whole organ thing started through when I was quite young. My dad had a friend named Jeff Avery who had an organ in his home in Armadale. Oh yeah, and it came out of the old Majestic Theatre in Flinders Street. Right. And it was only a photo player console. In other words, it just played. It wasn't a performing instrument. Right. And Jeff built a console for it. It was oh. only only four ranks, very, very small. <laughs> Basic. Yes. But that's what I remember. And that was my first sight of an actual organ. Right. You know, a theatre organ and the bells and all that sort of thing it was just fascinating for me as a kid. And how, well, what age were you? Oh, gee, I would have been seven or eight, I suppose. Right, right. And you sort of had got this attachment from that point. I think so. Yeah. And Dad and Jeff were fanatical theatre theatre organ enthusiasts and right. um, they used to listen to theatre organ records on Saturday afternoons over there and for a visit to Jeffo's as he called him <laughs> that was just heaven to me that was yeah. better than Christmas yeah just to go over there and just spend an afternoon over there right so capital in Sydney and then and then all sort of augmented and not long after that oh I think I'd actually got into the region and that was quite a fluke that happened through David Cross right uh, he used to work at Sutton's in the organ department Sutton's, now there's a name. Yes, yes. <laughs> they were in Elizabeth, Elizabeth Street, Street, opposite yeah. Brashes. Used to buy records there. Yeah, yeah. that was, um, they, they They sold all sorts of instruments there. One was the Wurlitzer 4100 with Spectratone, which <laughs> 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 it was sort of trying to emulate the theatre organ tremulance and yes. all that sort of thing. Yes. And David said to me one day, would you like to play the Regent organ? <gasps> and I said, I didn't know it was still there because it was covered over with a curtain on that side balcony, the, right. pill, the pillbox at the yes, front. Yes. They, were, they moved the organ up there when Cinemascope came because they had to build a, a screen out beyond the proscenium. That's it, right. And the organ was shifted up there because Stanfield Holiday was still playing it then. He was indeed. He was the uh, resident organist yes, there, wasn't he? Yes, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Stan on one or two occasions. I've got a few of his records, um, uh, an EP which I'd never seen three tracks on, on an EP on one side and then three on the other. Yes. That is that, a great organist. That was the little EP called A Cool Veranda, wasn't That's, it? I think something like that, yeah. Would you believe I edited that? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, David Cross put it out on his uh, Pagoda label. So uh, playing the Regent organ, what year are we talking there? It would have been 60, 63, 64, right, probably. Right. And David said, would you like to play it? We're having a little group going very early one Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, get a chance at rehearsal. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, no. We've got to be in there at 7.30 and out by 9.30 or something because yeah. of the morning yeah. show. Yeah. And there is a tape floating around which I have hidden under lock and key of <laughs> what I did that morning and nobody will ever get to hear it. <laughs> that bad, huh? But uh, as a result of that morning, um, I met one of the managers um, in the ma manager of the Athenaeum across mm. the road. Oh, yes. And he said, look, we want to keep this organ in good nick. It needs playing regularly. Would you like to come and practice on it? Wow, can you imagine that? Gee. So I was in there one morning practicing away and um, there was this gentleman in a suit sitting down in the stalls and the carpenter was up beside me standing at the console as he often did. He was an organ enthusiast. Right. Pat, Pat Quinlan was his name. Yeah. And, he's, and I said, Pat, who's that? who's that in the front stalls? He said, don't worry, dear boy, just keep playing, just keep playing. And I finally got it out of him. It was the general manager of Hoyt's, um, Reg Potter. Oh. And I thought, oh, my God, I shouldn't be here. Oops. And uh, <laughs> so Pat said, play September in the Rain when you finish what you're doing. He said, play that. And I said, why? He said, it's his favourite song. Ah. So I played it and all the little bells and all that sort of thing and the glockenspiel and, and looked around when I finished and he'd gone. And I thought, oh, well, that was a bit, a bit of a waste of time. And I was packing up ready to head off to work at the hospital and the curtains moved a little bit. Um, Pat had since gone back to his workshop. Mm. And this gentleman popped out and said, I think you uh, 
appear to like our organ here? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's absolutely wonderful. Right. And uh, he said, that piece you were playing a couple of minutes ago, he said, he said you know, that's my favourite song. I said, oh, is it? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, I've been thinking about perhaps we might organise a, uh, a Christmas spot. Mm. After the newsreel, we'll close everything down, put a red wash on the stage and get someone to announce. And if you could do maybe three or four really popular Christmas numbers, he said, we'll give it a go and see how it goes. Right. And? It worked. <laughs> um, and the following March, um, I was actually in Tassie with some university friends camping, you know, and uh, one of them picked up a paper one morning, a Melbourne paper, and said, I think you'd better make a phone call, Tony. What's this all about? Mm. And it had an advertisement for me commencing nightly for Goldfinger on the ma the world it's a pipe organ at the Regent Theatre. With the movie Goldfinger? Yes. Oh my yes. God. And I didn't know about it because my friends in the Theatre Organ Society, I think David Cross and others, yeah. had sort of arranged it with Hoyts and they were going to tell me later. Wow. I was a little bit mad at first that nobody had asked me, but then they couldn't, could they, you know? If you're on the top of Cradle Mountain, how do they contact you? Exactly. And what an honour, though. Well, it was the, the one month it was going to be, and it stretched out to about five years. That's fantastic. And you've put out a number of um, records on both vinyl and CD, but I, I've got one, and I love the one at The Regent, um, that uh, you've then subsequently found more tracks you had, didn't yes, you? Yes, that was the very first one that was recorded by Crest Records. And I think... Every record collection I've looked at has got that disc in it. It's amazing. I think I've got four copies at home. But um, <laughs> it's funny how it, it must have sold very well. It did about three or four gold records, actually, yeah. because it originally came out as uh, Academy Award songs. That's right. And then Marcus Hermit re-released re it on, on, on Stanza. Crest. Yeah, Stanza yeah. then. Yeah, yeah. Um, as Academy Award. No, even before that. Ah. Back in 1975 it came out again as Academy Award winners. Right. And that's when it, they had TV advertising and everything. That's when it got all the gold records because ah. I think KTEL and everyone were advertising records back then. And yeah. if you got onto TV with an ad, <laughs> you were guaranteed a gold. Oh, KTEL base on <laughs> Oh, yeah. But it's a, it's a brilliant album, uh, fantastic selection. Yes. Oh, Did you put that together yourself, that selection? Uh, well, um, Marcus came up with the idea, actually, mm. and he said, you know, we'd like to do Academy Awards, all the songs that won Academy Awards, you yes. know, When You Wish Upon a Star, oh, Zibbity Doo Dah, yeah. Days of Wine and Roses. Beautiful. And, Just, you know, they're timeless melodies, oh, Alex. they are. Yeah. They are, and they will last forever. Exactly. They will last forever. And the, the one that issued most recently, which is on his Stanza label, you had some tracks that had never they had never been issued before. Well, actually, the master tapes of two of the albums at the region were deleted by the company that bought, you know, and yep. they just sold yeah. the tapes, as, yeah. as you know. Yeah. But um, I still had a lot of them because I recorded them at the same time. Ah. And I had a lot of the material from With a Song in My Heart, which was the second album, and also uh, an album called More. And um, they these extra tracks, and including some numbers from the final recital at the Regent, mm. um, went on to those albums. And the CD called Interval at the Regent yeah. was made entirely from tapes that we did in our Saturday morning experiments. <laughs> there was never a recording session per se. Isn't that marvellous? And Interval at the Regent was entirely made up of that. And the last track, of course, was the showboat selection from the final concert. Yeah. Well, thank goodness that you've done that. And you, you, I mean, this is the thing that people have got the forethought to keep these recordings because you never know when they're going to be used. Exactly. And put out to public. And there's such a love of organ music still. Mm. There is. Well, as evidenced by the audiences that we had at the twin concerts, both right. at the Melbourne Town Hall and the Regent. Brilliant. That time. And Absolutely brilliant. Let's have another music break, and I'm going to play another track from this uh, Tony and Lynn in concert again. And this is Lynn Larson and uh, Tony Fenlon, and we'll have this track and uh, we'll back announce it.
well-deserved applause. The theme from Apartment, and uh, that's uh, yourself and uh, Lynn Larson. That's right, Alex. Where was that recorded? In Barrington, Illinois, just a bit out of Chicago. And you were at, saying it's a private residence. At private residence, and it holds over 400 people in the music room. It's wonderful? got a balcony like a theatre. It yeah. is immense. Terrific. Such good stuff. Very nice indeed. Uh, now, you do, uh, at the moment, you... You're not only sort of uh, doing bits and pieces around Melbourne, but you also go on ships, I think, don't you? I did. We yeah. haven't done any cruises because the um, lady and gentleman who ran the, the cruise company, it's, it's sort of a music interest group. You know how people go on golf trips and yeah. play bridge and cards and they, they have a, a group that travel as a sort of a coherent group. Right, right. They have their own activities on board. Well, this was a music group called Sea Safaris and we first joined them through Lynn, actually, mm. uh, in 1987. Right. And on a seven day cruise around the Hawaiian Islands. Oh, lovely. And then we went to Alaska and then we went to South Pacific and then we went to um, all around Norway and up the fjords. And uh, we've had about 16 cruises with them, but Very that nice. all finished about three or four years ago. Oh, that's sad. Mm. That's, not, that's not good. You've got another interest, and it's an interest that. Um, is dear to me, which is old radio <laughs> themes, and uh, you're a bit of a collector. And I got an email from you at one stage. What's this piece of music? And it was the Tinker Bell, you know, the theme from my son Tom. Oh, that's right. Yes, uh, I grew up with all that, Alex. It's yeah, just it's... a very dear part of my memory. I think it's wonderful. It really is, and we we still keep that alive here to quite an extent with serials that we run. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's your, did you have a favourite growing up, a personal favourite of cereal? Or? Oh, yes. Well, I, my parents were pretty strict. I mean, if I hadn't done my hours practice after school, I never got to listen to Superman or Biggles. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, well, you would have done your practice then. Oh, definitely I did. And But Biggles moved to the mornings um, it did. later on. It and did. Um, mum used to say, you know, you've got to get off to school, got to make your bed. So I'd go into the bedroom and I'd built myself a crystal set ah, yes. and with a long lead on my earphone so I could walk right around the whole bed while I was making it and mum could never work out why it took me 15 minutes to, to make a bed <laughs> I love it yeah. oh, gee, 15 with... minutes to make your bed mm, exactly the length of an episode isn't it amazing uh, yeah I find it, it takes me back when I when I hear something like that uh, the, we, we did an interview recently with uh, Peter Philp uh, and he's done this wonderful book on, on radio drama uh, and tying in all of those beautiful themes that were written by the likes of Sydney Torch, Robert Farnan and so on oh, and so forth. Definitely. What brilliant talent. Yeah, that's why I've been searching actually because when you grow up with that uh, sort of, with that whole, you know, theatre of the mind, which it is. It is. Um, you know the songs, but you don't know the names, and that's what I've been embarking on, you know. And for years, I knew these songs, knew the themes. I could sit down and play them. Mm. I had no idea what they were called or who wrote them. No. Thanks no. to you, I do now. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing was that the, the themes that, that were written and used were only released to radio and television stations, and it's only been probably since the late 80s that the production libraries decided they uh, could make some money and have put them out on CDs, and Chapel started this. Right. And I was lucky enough to uh, visit London and interview Robert Farnan uh, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the Robert Farnan Society, and he'd written 500-odd pieces for Chapel. Oh, and I sat yes. next to three guys who uh, worked for Chapel, and they were in the midst of transferring stuff to uh, various forms of digitising uh, the, the material, and they said, if there's anything that I'd like on a CD, let them know. So I did. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. <laughs> but there are some certain things that bring back lots and lots of memories. It's delightful talking with you, Tony. Mm. I want to play another track, and I'm going to play uh, one from um, the Black and White album, which is, um, tell me a little bit about this one, the uh, Ray Thornley and Tony Fenlon one. Yes, that was recorded at a dinner over two nights. Really? At the Athenaeum Club. And uh, John Baldwin, who invited us to play there, said, oh, is there any way we could record it? And I, I, um, I was nearly going to take my four-track TIAC in and record it, and uh, it was too difficult to both think of playing and recording, and so I got Bruce Adderley to record Terrific. it. Well, he did it digitally, and it came out really well. Pick the track that you'd like me to play. Oh, now, that's going to be hard. Um, da, 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 da. Foggy Day in London Town, that's a good jazz one. All right, well, we're going to end the program with a Foggy Day in London Town. 
And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, Tony. Thank you so much for making time to come and talk to us. I've been looking forward to it, Alex, and I hope it's not the last occasion. Terrific. I'm sure you'll be back. Thank you. And here is a foggy day in London.